Welcome back to Team's Garage and uh, something a little bit different for today. Uh, something a little bit esoteric. Yes, I'll be deciding uh, my favourite top five of cars I've actually owned. Uh, so let's kick off with the full list. It's uh, somewhat eclectic and uh, random. Uh, it has to be said, uh, but situations change in life and you have to make decisions you rather wouldn't have to. Uh, so uh, let's get rid of some of those straight off the bat and a handful more just to cut it down to a top 10. So there we have it, uh, a top 10 list to choose from. Hmm. Uh, this is going to be hard and uh, there's going to be uh, some random criteria involved. Um, so it's not just my favourite, it's best all round, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, you'll see as we go. And in at number six, wait, uh, he said five. Well, yeah, I know, but I couldn't leave this one In out. fact, I left it off the original list even. Um, but there you go, there's a spec. I'm not really going to run through that. You can read it for yourself. Obviously, very uh, decent performance for that era, as one would expect for the Corvette. Uh, always good bang for your buck. Traditional conventional layout for the Corvette. Uh, front engine, rear wheel drive. Very nice too. Why they stop short of the 200 miles an hour top speed by two, I do not know. Anyway, why do I personally like it so much? Well, I've always been a Corvette fan. Uh, I had a 69 Stingray, as you probably saw in the original list. Stunningly beautiful car. Uh, not so good to drive though. But I owned both my Corvettes in the UK, where they were rather special and uh, not your everyday car. Mine was in fact one of the first two imported into the country. Did it myself. So what did I particularly like about it? Where should we start? Well, first off, and uh, by no means least, uh, I had kind of lost interest in Formula One and was a fan of uh, sports car racing, particularly the American Le Mans series and of course Le Mans itself classic race that everyone should visit at least once i went pretty much every year and in their class uh, gt1 or whatever um corvette were of course very competitive and often winners of the 24 hour at le mans so this car came with a racing pedigree and that endurance racing no doubt had something to do uh, with the incredible reliability of this car i owned it from uh, 2006 all the way through to 2012 and nothing ever went wrong with it and believe me i drove it hard uh, including several track days uh, where of course it was also a lot of fun to drive and uh, very competitive it was my daily driver not that i drove it every day um, but uh, nevertheless a very comfortable car to drive especially on long distance one of the few cars i've ever owned uh, that I was able to drive, uh, for example, down to uh, the south of France in one hit with no discomfort whatsoever, uh, plenty of luggage space, two big suitcases in the back, sports bag, etc. So a proper GT car. I could go on, uh, but we're already uh, nearly three minutes in and uh, it's supposed to be a top five and we haven't even started yet. So get on with it. Uh, so to number five, uh, and in a similar kind of vein, uh, yes, the TVR Griffith. Kind of the British equivalent to the, uh, the Cobra, really. And yes, another Anglo-American collaboration, originally. About the same time as Mr. Shelby was dreaming up the Cobra, TVR turned to uh, the Griffith Motor Company in, out in New York and dumped a 4.7 litre motor in their Griffith at the time. Mine was one of the early 90s versions, the 4 litre, with the uh, Rover stroke Buick V8. A stunningly beautiful car, uh, in my humble opinion, and uh, you'll probably agree. And not dissimilar to drive uh, to the aforementioned Corvette, to be honest. Uh, a little rough around the edges, no power steering, no ABS, no driver aids whatsoever. In fact, you could pretty much drive it on the thrust. Oodles of fun to drive. And again, uh, for me, a daily driver. Uh, somewhat hard work without the power steering, but you get used to it. You grow some big forearms. And actually, a very practical car. A large trunk or boot. Um, sufficient to fit in. Uh, plenty of luggage. 
And again, extremely comfortable, uh, thanks to it being from the Peter Wheeler era, who was a uh, six foot four plus, I think, in height. Uh, the car was perfectly comfortable for long drives to France and other places. Yeah, it was very nimble. Uh, of course, it had the tendency to swap ends if you were not too careful on the throttle especially delicate in the wet and I'd like to dispel some of the myth about uh, unreliability as I say it was a daily driver and um, I really didn't have that many issues with it although it did end up like this yes it caught fire anyway enough of that uh, let's move on number four didn't have it for long uh, but of course we cannot leave out the Lancia Delta Integrale Evo 2. Phenomenal car, ultimate hot hatch, especially at the time. Six times world champion. Superb handling, superb fun. Somewhat practical, being a hot hatch and plenty of space, four seats. Reasonable boot. What has to be one of the world's coolest dashboards ever? It's like sitting in a fighter jet. Honestly, I could bang on all day about how good it is to drive, uh, but you already know that. That's why it won all those rally championships. And uh, I'd rather not talk about it anymore because I sold it for a stupidly low amount of money. And so to number three. And surprise, surprise, we're still with Lancia. Yes, the beloved Stratus. Yeah, I know. Shock horror. Everyone thought it would be my number one. Well, I mean, it is my number one favourite all time, but that doesn't make it the number one top best. Does it? Obviously, totally impractical, uh, but then it's not supposed to be. Not very comfortable, but then it's not supposed to be. Fun to drive? Well, of course it bloody well is. Then it's supposed to be, isn't it? Fantastic looking car? Well, of course, if you like wedges. Unique, innovative, world beating, all of the above. And certainly not an everyday car. And so again, oh, I could bang on forever about this car. Uh, but the reality is it's not the best, it's not the top. Uh, it just happens to be my personal favourite. And of course there's a whole damn series on this, so um, I don't need to bang on about it anymore. Shall we move on to number two? And yes, we've talked about this one before. In fact, we did a comparison uh, between it and the Stratos. Yes, folks, it's the uh, Lotus Elise, the S1 that I have. Another uncompromising design uh, like the Stratos. Uh, but more than that, it pretty much uh, changed the way cars were designed um, from then on, especially sports cars, any type of performance vehicle. And despite the fact he was no longer with us then, uh, God rest his soul, Mr. Colin Chapman, uh, it followed his mantra of adding lightness. So yeah, uh, by far the weediest performance figures we've seen. Uh, in terms of power and all that kind of stuff because uh, it didn't need it um, don't need oodles of power to build a, a fast fun car uh, just like the Stratos uh, totally impractical uh, boot space just about big enough to fit a tupper pot in even harder to get in and out of than the Stratos uh, not by much but the most ridiculous uh, convertible roof ever designed uh, but then it was an afterthought so be fair But yeah, uh, groundbreaking design aside, just a fabulous car to drive. I mean, the handling is sublime, it is unbelievable. I've said it before, uh, but a friend of mine at the time, a uh, very quick driver, quicker than me, uh, a Subaru Impreza Turbo, could not keep up with the Lotus Elise. Uh, took an ex-girlfriend out in it, um, she had to go to the doctor a week later and found out she was suffering from whiplash. Uh, just from the cornering. So just an astonishing car all round. Uh, really should be number one, I suppose. But it isn't. What on earth has he got? Has he bought a new car? Is it a McLaren F1? Well, I wish it was. And if I did an episode on five top cars that I'm never likely to 
own, then uh, that would undoubtedly be number one. That is my all-time most amazing car, I think, ever. Well, we're going to have to go outside. Well, of course it's not the Bel Air. It's not the Ghibli either, hiding in the corner there. Yes, folks, uh, we're staring at it. It is the Toyota FJ. What? In the immortal words of John McEnroe, uh, which apparently he never said, you cannot be serious. Well, actually, I am. This is an incredible vehicle. Not the paint job, obviously, and this particular one, but the Toyota FJ. Where shall we start? Well, it has surpassed the Corvette C6 in terms of reliability. I've now owned this vehicle 10 years and uh, driven it very hard, off-road, on-road, towing, thousands and thousands of miles, and it has never broken down. Some Toyota owners would say that it's barely running. I've done uh, 111,000 miles, which is uh, not a lot. Uh, my buddy Rick's Toyota Tundra truck did 350. Uh, my friend Sue and Paul have a forerunner that's done 450,000. I have towed race vehicles, horse trailers, donkeys, uh, all kinds of stuff up ridiculous inclines, uh, just phenomenal towing capability. Uh, it will cruise all day at 90, uh, I mean 60, officer. It is comfortable, it is durable. Uh, remember, I have two wolf dogs that have tried to tear the interior apart and whilst the back of the driver's seat has been shredded, the dashboard remains intact, which is quite remarkable. So again, uh, not top quality materials, but certainly durable. I've done some serious off-roading in it, uh, not just around here in Sedona, but uh, also down in Phoenix. Um, some fairly famous kind of off-road trails, which I've seen Jeeps turning back. And I mean rigged out Jeeps with lift kits and everything else. Uh, and my FJ is fairly stock in that respect. I have not lifted it. It's got the standard wheels and tyres on it. Um, again, just phenomenal off-road capability. And here's one of the things I particularly like about it uh, compared to all your modern vehicles, because I guess it's 10 years old. It's not really modern anymore, is it? Um, it's remarkably analog. And remarkably trashed. But let me explain. Um, so excuse the uh, the dog hair, but we have a full four speed manual shift, which means it will actually hold it in that gear. It won't kind of decide that you've forgotten and after 15 seconds just revert back to auto. You physically put it into third and it will stay in third until you put it into something else. Uh, likewise with the uh, the four wheel drive, so it's two wheel drive normally. Um, there you go. So you can, you manually shift it into uh, four wheel drive, which you can do while you're going along. Uh, and if you want it into the low ratio, you have to stop and uh, put it through that kind of J shift into low drive. I've only used that once. It has got some electric whiz kiddery, uh, like the hill descent and climb and stuff, um, traction off and on and lock diffs and all that kind of stuff. If you're really serious, again, I've never had to use it. Plus, it's just kind of funky. I mean, for starters, it's got suicide doors. How cool is that? It's got three windscreen wipers. That's pretty cool. And it's so ugly, it's cute. And on top of all that, uh, there are so many aftermarket mods and odds and sods that you can add. I've added an exhaust, uh, LED lights at the back, LED lights at the front, uh, Smitty built front fender with a winch and all kinds of stuff. So it's number one because if I could only keep one vehicle, uh, that would be the FJ. I can't ever see myself selling it. Uh, I have had numerous offers from the dealership to buy it back uh, pretty much what I paid for it. Uh, and uh, they continue to hold their value, if not increase, which is 
again, rather astonishing. Not that that was ever a consideration. I mean, basically, I was looking for a capable off-road vehicle. I looked at the Jeep, I looked at Land Rovers, and um, decided that none of them could hold a candle to the FJ. It is in a terrible state and um, will remain so until, um, sadly, one day the uh, wolf dogs will pass. And uh, at that point, I will kind of probably gut it and put some racing seats in there and, and make it a like an off-roady type thing. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. But in the meantime, best car I ever owned. So, as always, uh, thanks for watching. If you thought the video was any good, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, subscribe down here somewhere. I'm going to be doing some more of this kind of stuff as well uh, on the channel. So, uh, stay tuned. And, uh, of course, encourage others to watch my lunacy.